All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, last but certainly not the least in terms of our products today. Um, here, let me barely pull it up. Uh, okay, uh, thanks again for the organizers and for my panelists here. Um, I'll be talking about the Cloud Trigger for Acute DVT. Uh, no disclosures. So again, just to rehash what we talked about earlier, uh, you know, DVT is, is certainly a morbid kind of disease, and more than half of our patients who ever develop a DVT end up developing post-thrombotic syndrome. And certainly a lot of these patients who end up having severe DVTs will have severe PTS, including uh, venous ulcers, and their quality of life is severely impacted. Um, a lot of our medical uh, uh, journals and society guidelines have largely favored anticoagulation as a standard of care for routine acute DVT. Um, and even our industry and, and uh, instrument uh, kind of randomized controlled trials over the past decade, as Dr. Desai alluded to, kind of it, it doesn't really show a clear conclusive evidence to use pharmacomechanical, pharmacolytic therapy uh, as first line, um, certainly uh, in an uh, uh, all-comer population. Um, in our recent experience, uh, mechanical thrombectomy with clot system has shown potential in improving long-term outcomes in these DVT patients. Um, so what exactly is a clot trigger system? It's actually one of my favorite tools in my toolbox for DVT. Um, essentially, it's a 13 French system. It's an over-the-wire system, and it, it consists of a nitinol coring element that you can see here, uh, followed by a collection bag. So essentially, you over, over the wire, you advance your system into the uh, large bore vein um, that has the, your, your clot of target, and you kind of pass this a coring element distal to it, and as you pull it back, it kind of grips and grabs that clot and brings it into the collection bag. Um, and then it's retracted through the clot retriever sheath that you can see here. Again, this is a, a device that does not need the use of thrombolytics, usually does not need an ICU stay. Um, and again, the blood loss is very low. And again, as I alluded to in our previous talks, these are you know single session outpatient kind of procedures that can be done. Okay, so what about the data? We've talked about no, no real RCTs yet that have, uh, that have been made to date, but there is one coming down the pipeline, which I'll mention later. Um, this is the clot registry, and I'm happy to present the most recent data from the registry uh, from the past week. Um, so this registry, it consists of 499 patients uh, across 43 U.S. sites. It's a prospective multi-center single-arm study um, in all-comer patients. This cohort that we'll look at today, 76% um, or 379 of them had iliofemoral DVT. The objective was to look at, obviously, the outcomes of using the clot treater system as well as safety, uh, with the primary endpoint being a complete or near complete removal of thrombus um, assessed by a martyr score. So the martyr score is basically a venographic assessment of how much thrombus is remaining within the vessel. Uh, till date, we had around 265 patients that had been followed up in their one-year visit. Uh, looking quickly at the baseline characteristics, one thing I wanted to note here is that about a third of these patients had a contraindication to thrombolysis. So maybe some trauma or recent surgery or, or metastatic disease, they just weren't, weren't able to get thrombolytics. Uh, on the limb level, we saw that about a quarter of them did have a prior treatment for a current DVT. And uh, one thing to note here is that the age of the thrombus after it was extracted from the patient was seen to be, you know, a, a varying of ages. Um, again, don't really want to say mention chronic here, but uh, we have acute uh, at 30%, subacute at 31%, and you know, the older, uh, more organized thrombus or collagen at like 38%. Safety profile, again, was very favorable for this device. Uh, All-cause all mortality only was around 0.5%. Uh, uh, one episode of pulmonary embolism, which was device-related. However, there's no evidence of kidney injury or, acute, or vessel or valve damage during the first 30 days. All right, looking at our endpoint, the mortar score, as you can see here, the pre-procedure score was around a 9.5, which went down drastically to about a zero. But what's most more interesting is that nearly two-thirds of these patients had 100% removal of thrombus. Um, and their primary endpoint was actually uh, greater of 75%, which was seen in 90% of these patients. So looking at our rethrombosis or residual thrombus event rate at six months, you can see that it's about 8.5%, which is a modest you know, event rate, and it's comparable to many of the studies that we've seen in the past. Looking at our patient clinical improvements and quality of life improvements, we see that there is an immediate benefit at six months from with the uh, VCSS scores, pain scores, and quality of life assessments, and that has been sustained to that one-year time point. 
finally, what I think is the most important slide here is looking at our Velalta scores and our PTS severity. We can see that you know the Velalta at baseline was around a nine, um, and then dropping down to about a one at six months and staying at one at one year. Uh, but more more importantly, here you can see that at one year, 81% of these patients reported no PTS or essentially a Velalta of zero to four. Um, and this is in direct contrast to the two-year data that we have from those trials that I mentioned before, where the PTS rate, um, the occurrence of PTS, was around between 28% in CAVA to about 43% in a tract. <clears throat> so what can we draw from these conclusions from um, this uh, observational study here? Uh, we can tell that you know, clot shiver is effective in these patients with iliofemoral clot. You know, more than 90% experience complete or near-complete thrombus removal, and you know, uh, more importantly, it's, they're treated irrespective of their symptom duration or clot chronicity. So essentially, these are all comer clot patients. Um, these are safe procedures uh, with a very low all-cause mortality and no, no real significant events, greater than 0.5%. And again, the PTS rate was very low at one year. So I know this is a lower extremity DVT conference, uh, but I also wanted to mention what else can clot retriever do? Uh, I wanted to highlight one of my cases over the past couple of months. This is a 48-year-old male with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. You know, unfortunately, he had multiple chemotherapy regimens, radiation therapy, and now he's unfortunately on single agent gemcitabine with progression of disease. He's coming in with, from his uh, medical oncology office uh, complaining of worsening dyspnea, facial flush, flushing, upper extremity and neck and facial edema, and just generally not doing too hot. Um, so we get the CT as he comes through the ER. I'll play the CT for you here. So I'm sure you guys all saw that big mass in the right upper lobe with multiple bilobar lung nodules here. Um, and then he has some element of you know, rib destruction anteriorly. And we know that there, he has a left chest metaport with a, with a port catheter going through, but there's near occlusive or complete occlusion of the left brachycephalic vein as well. So since uh, his symptoms are rapidly declining here, we chose to talk to him, talk to him about palliative approach for treatment, um, and in, in essence, reconstructing his SVC uh, for palliation. So we brought him to the IR suite, and we accessed both upper extremities just to get a lay of the land, and here's a brachial vein venogram from the right side, and you can see there's complete occlusion at the level of the sub, uh, left, right subclavian vein with numerous chest wall collaterals. Again, on the left side, <clears throat> kind of the same uh, idea here, but we do, we do see that port catheter there. So we turned our attention pri uh, primarily to the right side. We, we were able to cross fairly quickly with a glide wire and a crossing catheter, and you can see now this venogram shows the extent of the disease all the way to the right atrium. Okay, so we uh, the first steps here for us were just to do a plain old a balloon venoplasty. Uh, sequentially upsizing the, the balloons, and then our venogram post. <clears throat> now you can see here there's a little bit more improved fl uh, flow, but you can see clearly intraluminal filling de defects, debris, you know, probably various ages of clot, maybe even some tumor thrombus in there. So at this point, we call our you know, neighborhood rep here, and we get our clot shiver device uh, in inserted from the right brachial vein. And hopefully it's projecting well. You can see the actual coring element right around here, adjacent to the port catheter. And you can see the distal end of the collection back kind of draping down all the way down into the abdomen. And this bullet marker kind of signifies the end of that collection back. So very carefully watching that port catheter very closely, we took a couple of passes uh, with a clot shaver here. <clears throat> and our venogram post showed you know, clearance of the intraluminal filling defects of, the, of, the, of that vein. Um, clearly, there is still a significant occlusion or compression. Uh, we took our ice catheter, kind of giving us our landmarks for where we want to land our stents and even sizing our stents. And after placing two stents here, we see our venogram showing rapid inline flow through the SVC and the brachycephalic vein into heart. Uh, so on the table, we gave him a dose of Lobanox before he left the room, um, and we d uh, d discharged him on one milligram per gram BID. Uh, for for uh, as long as he'll live. Um, so over the next couple of days, he experienced markedly reduced facial flushing and edema, generally feeling a lot better. We saw him again in follow-up uh, in about three months, and uh, his CT that he had gotten for his cancer surveillance essentially shows a patent SVC stent at that time. Um, so this was a very good outcome for us, for him, and it made his, uh, you know, his symptoms a lot better 
over the, over the last couple of months. So I want to end with this final slide here, as was alluded to uh, by Dr. Desai. You know, this is the first RCT in uh, in the market here for for mechanical thrombectomy for these uh, clot uh, for these lower extremity clot DVT patients. This is an RCT of clot retriever versus anticoagulation in DVT. I believe the first patient was enrolled earlier this year, um, so we're all looking forward to the the data that comes out of this. All right, thank you. <laughs>